Hi everybody, I'm Doug Barr, the current chairman of the St. Helena Forum for Innovation and Creativity. Our mission is to inform, entertain, and we hope inspire by presenting artistic performances and exchanges of ideas on a wide variety of humanities-based subjects. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the third in a limited series of virtual presentations. The first program leaned towards the sciences with oceanographers Alexandra Cousteau and Megan Brosnan discussing ways to restore our oceans in just one generation. The second featured dance performances and a discussion of Martha Graham's incredible history and contributions to 20th century art. And today we're going to be talking about a combination of art and science in a conversation between museum expert and member of our own board of directors, Peggy Lohr, and noted author and Egyptologist, Dr. Kara Cooney. Before we get started, let me tell you just a little bit about each one of our guests. Peggy Lohr is a museum professional with global experience in museum planning and program development, museum architecture and design, and museum leadership. She currently serves as president of International Museum Planning Consultants. Prior to that, she was the interim vice president for global arts and culture and director of the Asian Society Museum in New York City. Additionally, Peggy was the interim president and director of the Corcoran Gallery of Art and College of Art and Design in Washington, D.C., where she facilitated the merger between the Corcoran and the National Gallery of Art and my alma mater, George Washington University. Peggy served as the founding director of the new National Museum of Qatar in Doha and as director of the Museum Studio of Warsanger's Architects PC. She was the founding president and director of two American institutions, the Wolfsonia Museum and Research Center in Miami, Florida, and Genoa, Italy, and Copia, the American Center for Wine, Food, and Art, right here in Napa Valley. Uh, earlier in her career, Peggy was the director of Smithsonian Institution's Traveling Exhibition Service, and she was awarded the Smithsonian Gold Medal for Distinguished Service, previously given to only eight individuals in the whole history of the institution. She also served as the first program director of the Institute of Museum Services, which is the federal funding agency for American museums, and as curator of education and assistant director of the Indianapolis Museum of Art. And finally, if that's not enough, Peggy served as the president of the International Committee of Museums headquartered with UNESCO in Paris. Dr. Kara Cooney is an Egyptologist, archaeologist, associate professor of Egyptian art and architecture, and chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Culture at UCLA. She was raised in Houston. She earned her Bachelor of Arts in German and Humanities at the University of Texas in Austin, and was awarded her PhD by Johns Hopkins University for Near Eastern Studies. She was part of an archaeological team excavating at the Artisan's Village of Deir el Medina in Egypt, as well as Dashur and various tombs at Thebes. Dr. Cooney was a Crest Fellow at the National Gallery of Art and worked on the preparation of the Cairo Museum exhibition called Quest for Immortality, Treasures of Ancient Egypt. She took a three-year postdoctoral teaching position at Stanford University, during which she acted as fellow curator for Tutankhamun and the Golden Age of the Pharaohs at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And following two years at the Getty Center, Dr. Cooney began a tenure-track position at UCLA. She's currently investigating coffin reuse during the Bronze Age collapse, allowing her to examine funerary objects in dozens of museums all over the world, including the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, the Louvre in Paris, and British Museum in London, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Her research in coffin reuse primarily focuses on the 20th dynasty and its ongoing. In addition, she has authored a long list of scholarly papers and articles and four extremely popular books, including The Woman Who Would Be King, Hatshepsut's Rise to Power in Ancient Egypt, which I've read and it's fantastic, When Women Ruled the World, Six Queens of Egypt, and the soon-to-be-released The Good Kings, Absolute Power in Ancient Egypt and the Modern World. And finally, Dr. Cooney hosted Egypt's Lost Queen, which featured Dr. Zahi Hawass, and she also produced a comparative archaeological series entitled Out of Egypt for Discovery Channel, which you can find streaming on Amazon or Netflix. Everyone, please say hello to Peggy Lohr and Dr. Kara Cooney. Hi, Peggy. Hi, Kara. Thank you both for doing this. It's great to have you here with us at the Forum. Uh, I know you have a great deal to talk about, so Peggy, if you're ready, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Doug, and a warm hello to you, Dr. Cooney, and to our audience. The Egyptians are some of the early prophets of beauty and design. They were storytellers and builders who strove to please and appease the gods to assure their afterlives. 
Their contributions to our material culture and the history of human society are both legend and reality. But there's another side to ancient Egypt, its brutality, class slavery, and some of the gender issues we will talk about today. We're going to have a conversation, not only about Egypt generally, but in particular, we're going to focus on its famous queens and what it meant for a woman to rule in these early times and in the environment of ancient Egypt, one of agriculture and the flow of the Nile, prayer to the gods, and the bellicose behavior that was often necessary for Egypt to continue to exist. We're going to consider the complex iconography that has come down to us from the famous historians and archeologists who discovered these tombs and deciphered the hieroglyphic writings adorning their interior walls. I'm wondering how many of us dreamed of being an Egyptologist by the age of nine. I think there may be quite a few of us and maybe we can satisfy some of our yearnings today in our conversation with the amazing Dr. Kara Cooney. So again, Dr. Cooney, welcome. Let's jump right into your world of Egyptology. You consider yourself a social historian and your books bear this out because you extrapolate from human nature as we know it today back to ancient Egypt and you work off the records and the writings, of course, that have been discovered. And then you tell us these amazing stories. So my question is, what is your thought process as you try to excavate the behavior and agendas of Egypt's ancient women, but also their desire to rule? And what really happened inside those ancient palace walls? Uh, thanks, Peggy. Well, the, the first step that I have to take is to not separate the ancient Egyptians so much from ourselves. And I think it's something that we tend to do quite often, that we think of the Egyptians as being full of magic and mystery and untold stories and, and all kinds of secrets and that they're somehow different from what we are. Uh, but we have the same DNA. We have very much the same social systems. Um, we, we are very much the same people. And so it's helpful to me to look at the powerful women of Egypt through that exact same lens and to try to understand how a, a female who's trying to manufacture power would do so in her society. And to, given that we're talking about a time period that's far in the past, to try to use how we human beings function, whether it's here in the United States or in Afghanistan or in modern day Egypt, if we can use some of those comparisons that can be helpful. And I think it, it helps to not separate ourselves from the ancient Egyptians. Well, let's take us to the heart of the, of, of, of the brutality. Would you take us to the beginning of the dynasty story and the subject of burial practices? It seems the earliest ones were the most brutal. And um, evidently I'm told that one of the first things students of archeology span learn is that the dead don't bury themselves. So there's a lot of evidence and information that accompanied these burials. And that's how we know there was so much drama and cruelty around the Egyptian burial ceremony. Can you help us look at this practice through the eyes of the young Marnia who became a queen in the first dynasty? What would she have experienced as she was standing um, near the ceremony where her father, the king, was being buried. First dynasty burial practices of the Egyptian kings are difficult to talk about. So let me, let me start with that. Um, the words cruel have been used, brutal, all of those things are correct, but it's an interesting thing to note that early kingship, no matter where it is in the world, whether it's in Europe or Africa or in Asia or in the New World, has very often been characterized with a, a kind of sacrificial burial in which the king is so important that he gets to bring with him his soldiers, his women, his courtiers. And this is something that, that is documented all over the world. And it shouldn't surprise us then that in ancient Egypt, they did the same thing, that when kingship was new, they reified it. They proved it by making the mourning, the keening of the king's death that much greater, that much more um, impactful by taking some of the courtier's family members with them into the grave, showing the power of the king, um, intensifying the mourning, sh showing what he was capable of. These kinds of 
sacrificial burials don't last for very long in most parts of the world because they're so socially expensive and problematic. It's the kind of thing that your elites are going to rebel against at a certain time. And it, no different in ancient Egypt. It's something you see in the first dynasty, but it doesn't continue into the second. Now, as for Mernaith, she would have been a very highly placed wife, if not the most highly placed wife. So her husband, Jet, dies after a rather short period of time from what we can see. And he leaves a number of younger sons to one of whom will take the throne after him. And when that son is chosen, we don't know exactly how that would have happened. It's up to Mayor Nath to one, bury her dead husband, to bury the king. And then number two, in so doing, make sure that her young son, Den, is installed upon the throne. So that all of these things are happening simultaneously. The burial of the, burial of the previous king, the installment of the new king, and the actions are all cemented by this one woman, this one queen by the name of Mare Nath, who is acting on behalf of her younger son who can't make these decisions on his own. And it's up to her to decide who lives or dies. And it's an interesting thing that other Egyptologists have, have talked about. I, I haven't been a part of this discovery work, but have been able to document that the tombs before where there were sacrificial burial, more women were sacrificed, um, other members of society. But in this particular moment, where there's a young king to protect in the burial of the king before, to surround that burial, many males and younger boys were included in the, the sacrifice. Um, the younger boy is a little hard to prove bioarchaeologically because those skeletons are very hard to sex and determine. But it does seem that there were many burials of mothers and, and older children. And so one could suppose that Mernath is potentially being risk averse and is trying to remove threats to the throne during the burial of her husband, King Jet. Well, I appreciate your correction to my horrible pronunciation, Merneth. Now I understand. Um, what about Neferusabeth? Is that correct? Really, there's Peggy. There's no. Um, there's nothing to apologize for because we don't know how ancient Egyptian was pronounced. We only okay. have Coptic as it is pronounced today, and the ancient Egyptians didn't write with vowels. And so, without all of those helpful markers to understand how something might have been pronounced, your guess is kind of as good as mine. So um, okay. we don't even know for Nefru Sobek. Nefru Sobek was it pronounced Sobek Nefru or Nefru Sobek, and uh, where how the word okay. of her name is actually formed. So it's much more complicated than just mere pronunciation. Okay, and we have Hatshepsut and Nefertiti and Tarosret and Cleopatra. Should we assume yeah. that those who came after the others likely built on their predecessors' accomplishments or perhaps learned from their mistakes? Uh, what, what do they have in common and what were some of their mistakes? You know, it's hard to know how much legacy and history play a part in how much these women are able to learn from what came before them. We're talking about a 3,000 year spread of history. So this is not easy. For Nefru Sobek, is she able to look at the history of Mernaith? Probably not. The history of Mernaith is 5,000 years in the past. And the only reason we know anything about it is because their burials have been left at the site of Abydos. So Nefru Sobek, she's probably using the stories of queens of the end of the sixth dynasty who are, who are very powerful as well, though none is documented as having taken the position of king. Nefru Sobek will be our first. Um, so how much she knows, how much Hatshepsut knew about Nefru Sobek before her, it's all arguable, it's all debatable, and it all depends on there being two histories that are maintained. One that perfect history that you keep in a temple that makes the authoritarian regime look perfect. And the other, a, a more messy history, a history that we know the Egyptians kept, at least from the fourth century Egyptian uh, priest, Manetho, who wrote in Greek. We do know that there was an interest in keeping tabs on that more messy history. So it, it's, it's quite possible. But as to your question about the failures that these women made, one point is really, really interesting that when you mention these names and you mention the name Cleopatra, you know, everyone knows the name Cleopatra and we don't even have to ask how to pronounce it. It's no problem. It's not a very easy name to pronounce, but we have no issues with it. 
And that's because she is remembered as a failure. She is the cautionary tale. She is the one who got it all wrong, in a sense. She did not leave Egypt better than she found it. And Egypt is gobbled up by the Roman Empire after her rule. And it means that our cultural memory, our films, our plays, our, our interest in what we regurgitate and retell is very much about the failure and rather not the success. So if you think of somebody like Nefru Sobek, the first female king of Egypt, or Hatshepsut, the longest lived and most successful female king of Egypt, those names are lesser known, harder to pronounce. We almost have to resuscitate them from the dead because, and I argue this in my book, success is something that is very transferable. It's something that is somebody, like in a meeting, if you, if you um, give your boss a great idea and your boss takes it into the meeting and claims it as his or her own, success is something that people want to be a part of. And so you can easily reassign it. And that seems to have been what happened. So Hatshepsut, and we'll get to her, I know, she gets erased. Nefru Sobek also in, in her way is very much erased. And what those women did is instead taken on by, by other kings who served later. Well, and, and what you've described is why archaeologists are always bantering and uh, disagreeing with each other, I would imagine. <laughs> um, I want to turn to the famous bust of Nefertiti, uh, a little bit uh, more current in history. She was excavated in 1912 by German archaeologists. And when her sculpture was found, the lead archaeologist in the excavation, I'm told, was um, speaking either to the press or to colleagues back in Germany. And what he said was, the color looked fresh. Um, there's no use in describing it. You just have to see it. And I'm told that the head was then put in a box. There was some dirt thrown on it. Uh, the locals uh, that provided the licenses were told it wasn't really very important, and it was shipped back to Germany. Now, today, this would be illegal, but I'm wondering, given all the current activity around the repatriation of objects worldwide, especially in Africa, will the Egyptians want Nefertiti to come home? Have they already asked? Oh, they have asked. They have asked many times, and they should get Nefertiti back, in my, mm -hmm. in my humble opinion. Um, the way that, I mean, first, let's, let's go back to the way that this was um, discovered. When Nefertiti was discovered at the site of Amarna in Middle Egypt, Egypt was under colonial occupation and colonial rule. And the antiquity service was run by Europeans, and it was run by a system of French, English, German, mainly French, though. Um, that's, that's who was traditionally in charge of the antiquity service. And even under British colonial rule, it maintained itself under French colonial occupation. And when somebody came in to dig, they would dig at a particular site, some white European or American would come in to dig. And then there would be something called a partage, a, a separation, um, a division. And that partage would happen in communion with the, the French occupant of the Ministry of Antiquities or, and the, the excavator. And there would be an agreement of that piece stays in the Cairo Museum, that one you can take to New York. That piece stays in the Cairo Museum, that you can take to Germany, which who's ever running the dig, right? So there's great incentive for Europeans and Americans and Australians and whoever to come to Egypt in this colonial moment to dig and then take things back to their museums. And this is how we have filled the British Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art and on and on, right? And, but, so even here in this colonial context, there are issues because the Germans were not up front from what we can say with the French Ministry of Antiquities and how they presented what they had found. And the Nefertiti find was from what we can see obfuscated. There was um, a little underhanded communication about, you know, oh, we found this thing, this is what it looks like, kind of not in great shape, not completely shown. And then it's whisked off to Germany before anybody knows what's going on. As soon as that bust appeared in Berlin and its and likenesses were and photos were sent around the world, the French ministers knew exactly what they had lost and were incensed. And so it's funny that the Egyptians are the ones that have to ask for Nefertiti back. But long before that, there had been an inter-European um, battle um, about Nefertiti. This goes back more than a hundred years. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's an object that um, is is it's kind of she's kind of reminds me of Helen of Troy, <laughs> if you like. Um, she's been she's been kidnapped, um, 
She's the most beautiful woman in the world. Everybody wants her and the Germans don't want to give her back in the same way the British don't want to give back the Parthenon marbles. It is their, it is a claim that, may, that they feel makes them uh, richer but through its wasn't ownership. It also, but, wasn't it also, um, we are all discussing these wasn't things. Wasn't it also so though that, that the archeologists yeah, in those days were a little nervous about the Egyptians becoming more professional and learning hieroglyphics because they were worried about the licenses they were receiving and the sites that they had to dig, uh, dig with. Yes, the colonialism was so extreme that Egyptians were barred from being a part of antiquities work. And while there were Egyptian Egyptologists um, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, it's, it's um, taken a long time. And, and it's taken a long time to fight the battle of racism and colonialism within the science or, or field of Egyptology. And that battle is far from won. So even though the Egyptians do run their antiquities organization, colonialism's roots go deep and the pain and the trauma is, these are old wounds that are very difficult to heal. And if you have systematically weakened the study of antiquity by Egyptians and strengthened the study of antiquity by Europeans, Americans, Australians, Japanese, then they're still going to have an upper hand on you in terms of getting PhDs, the value of those PhDs. And those inequities last today. And those are the kinds of things that I, as an Egyptologist, must be cognizant of and must be on the front lines of, of trying to help solve as an ally, not as somebody who can tell my Egyptian colleagues the way things should be or as, a, as somebody that's throwing out crumbs, but as an ally working in negotiation and concert with my colleagues to try to see where help is needed and, mm -hmm. and what I can do. This is not yeah. my country. I know that I'm, I'm taking you uh, hither and yon in various places, but there is in, in an hour with a plus, a little plus, it's very hard to cover all of the questions I have for you. But I, I'm going to take you into the world of the divine feminine, which is a concept that evolves through time and even is found today in gender studies. Um, I want to know uh, about the pyramid test, the uh, text that talked about them back in the fifth dynasty. But if you could combine that with an answer about the, the divine concept for the divine origin of kings and queens, of course, because it seems to me like the Egyptians that turned to the gods for their behavior were paralleling their behavior on the gods, which included incest and the marrying of, of daughters to fathers and brothers. What... Um, was it the, the the gods that they looked to that they found through other mythologies, or did they create the behavior of the gods so that they could use that very behavior? I mean, in the same way that the dead don't bury themselves, I, I could also claim that, that, you know, no divinity exists from his or her own side, including... Uh, Abrahamic divinities, and that's that's my opinion. All of these things are human constructs, human creations. However, we go about doing it, and no matter what we say about things being the word of God, everyone wants to claim it as the word of God. Thus, it's more authentic, right? Um, so, all of these religions exist within their space and rise up within a particular geography, particular culture, particular way of being. Um, what's so interesting about the divine feminine? as you put it, it's a wonderful phrase, um, is how it is co-opted and contained on behalf of an authoritarian patriarchal structure, how it works so well to protect that system of government. I'll give you an example from a class that I teach at UCLA. This class is called Women in Power in the Ancient World. And we don't just do Egypt. We talk about India and Greece and Rome and... Um, ancient Levant and Mesopotamia and, and many other places around the world. And students are often interested in the divine feminine and how the divine feminine often seems to be uh, in conflict with patriarchal rule. For example, Greece is one of ancient Greece is a place where females had almost no power in the political system. It's, it's, um, it's a hard place to be a female in the ancient world. And yet they have some of the most powerful divinities within their religious structure. I would argue the same for ancient India, where females had very little political power. But if you look at Durga and, and Kali, you know, you have these brilliantly smart and effective and often violent divinities 
who didn't take anything from anybody, right? And so I have, you know, there are other people that work with things like this, that these, this divine feminine is very old. It is older than patriarchy itself. It is older than the agricultural revolution. And these things existed, male gods existed, female gods existed. But when you invent this idea of an agricultural state and each man in charge of his plot of land and, and all of that ownership and private property and all of that that comes with the patriarchy, supporting one male's descent in lineage, whether it be the king or a householder, these females were then co-opted to be in Egypt and in India and in Greece, fierce protectors of their lords. And so you take all of that power of the divine feminine and you twist it into something that protects their father, protects their husband, protects their brother, protects their son, instead of looking to their sisters and their mothers and their daughters. And I think that this is something we're all discussing now. You know, what is divinity? What is God? What, how, how should we understand the way the world works and power and all of these things? I think this is a discussion that the ancient Egyptians were having, the ancient Indians, the ancient Greeks, because religions are, are so much older than our political systems. And sometimes they don't always jive. I think we're actually entering a time period which will be post-patriarchal, if you like, in which things like the divine feminine can be celebrated without the weight of having to support the good man at the head of the table. And I look forward to, to seeing that. May, well, it turning from the, to the gods and the we'll divine, the um, and the, even the luxury of the palace, which we haven't really, really discussed, I want to talk about the common folk. What must it have been like for them economically and socially? Uh, for instance, when the Nile flooded, there must have been malaria, constant discomfort. Uh, there wasn't much medical science. What can you tell us about the common person that lived in, in, in Egypt during those days? It's a hard subject to talk about for Egyptologists because we are flooded with information from the uncommon person, from the wealthy person who built temples and left statues and had tombs, all of these inscriptions. And 95% of ancient Egyptians couldn't read or write, couldn't afford any of these uh, pieces of conspicuous consumption and couldn't participate in all of this. So it's, it's hard to get at who these people were, what their thoughts and feelings were. You know, if you're poor and you can't write, how can you commit to, to any sort of way that is preserved to us what they felt about the world, what they thought of their divine space, if it was different from what the rich people thought? It's something that Egyptologists are really jumping into with both feet but they have to use all of their abilities to work with evidence. Evidence that's not just textual, evidence that includes domestic spaces, amulets, um, things that we wouldn't consider artistic enough to put in a museum because the quality is lower level. Um, Bioarchaeology, looking at a human body and seeing, as you pointed out, what kinds of diseases people may have suffered from, what their teeth looked like. Um, being an ancient or rich Egyptian in a place that's so um, so fertile, so wet, at least where the Nile is touching it, it, it involved all kinds of parasites and other communicable diseases. And every Egyptian would have suffered from, from these things. It's not a question of when you get, or if you get malaria in Egypt, it's a question of when. And intestinal diseases were par for the course, cholera type things, though cholera I don't think had made the scene in the ancient world at the time periods that I'm talking about. But really when you get down to it for the, for the normal peasant person, life was very much the same as it was for their forefathers and continued pretty much the same as after. All of these dramatic moments of political change and dynasties and, and other things, the peasant on, on his or her land would have continued their life very much the same as they had for millennia. And so there's much less change for them. That's why many of the stories I tell are the stories of the rich and the wealthy and the fabulous and that top 1%. Um, for, the, for the poor people, unless they're dealing with somebody who really is over the top in terms of their megalomaniacal changes, somebody like Akhenaten perhaps, to whom Nefertiti was married, then maybe the peasant is going to really notice some things. Or if it's a time period when 
Egypt was going through uh, government breakups, failures of government, collapse of some kind, environmental collapse, then everybody would have suffered, um, but the peasants most especially. So th those kinds of questions are things that we're looking at more. And as somebody, and I'll end it with this, as somebody who studies funerary practices, it's a wonderful thing to find a burial of a poor person with no coffin, buried in a fetal position, facing, facing the rising sun, facing towards the east. You know, you get an idea that maybe they even had a, a very old but parallel religious system that was different from what the elite Egyptians had. And th those are the kinds of things that we just have to work with all of the evidence that's available to us to try to figure out. Well, I've, also, I've often wondered, you know, how we know what we know about ancient Egypt. And there are two luminaries that appear in the early 19th century. One of them is the French scholar Jean-Francois Champollion, and the other, well, Champollion went along with Napoleon on his Egyptian campaign. So he gave us uh, also some of the workings of the hieroglyphic writing system. And then there was John Wilkinson, who I believe was a Brit. Um, and he visited almost every known Egyptian site and uh, tomb scenes and with tomb scenes and descriptions and I'm sorry, inscriptions. But he also um, he was very involved in going to every pharaonic monument that we knew about at that time. My question is, do these men represent the beginning of Egyptology and are there others that should be credited with that? It's the beginning of Western Egyptology as the field that we know it. And one could say that that began with the Description de l'Egypte, which was funded by Napoleon's campaigns and published um, in the decades after. But you could go much farther back and you could see the history of an Egyptology, a proto-Egyptology, if you like, going back to the ancient Romans, if you visit the gardens of Tivoli, if you see how many obelisks were brought to Rome, there are more obelisks in Rome than there are in Egypt because the Roman empire took them all as symbols of masculine power. Um, so th there's, um, there's a, there was a great ancient interest in ancient Egypt. There was great Greek interest. Herodotus d devotes books to Egypt and Egypt is one of the central players of his histories. And he's not the only ancient um, Greek writer who includes Egypt to that extent. Um, one could then say Egyptian history being 3,000 years old has its own internal space. So you could look at the son of Ramses II, Khan Waset, who was a high priest of Ptah, but also was studying the antiquities, re reconstructing the antiquities, um, conserving them, um, you know, putting things back to rights and then putting his father's name there and saying, I did this for Ramses II. And so there was a kind of study of antiquities happening in antiquity, <laughs> which is, it seems confusing, and, but and, it's and not they were, they were realized. Yeah, go ahead. And they were all and they were all over Egypt, uh, warmongering and bringing things home. So you're absolutely right. There would have been a lot of information and writing even in the early days about it. But I, I want to move you um, into your book, Women Who Ruled the World. You mentioned uh, Angela Merkel, Margaret Thatcher, Elizabeth Warren, and some other contemporary women in politics. And uh, you made a wonderful, poignant comment in comparing early Egyptian women rulers to some of the women in politics today, saying, and this is a quote, that they are often considered to be erratic, flighty, illogical, deceitful, and ruled only by hot flashes and full moons. Now, I think probably only two women could successfully be having this conversation, but it's really a, an amazing um, statement. And I wanted to know if you would just give us a, a brief comparison of ancient Egyptian attitudes, which you've already alluded to, toward women with those of today, and how might an ancient Egyptian queen rule differently than a man? It's such a hard question to even ask, does a woman rule differently from a man? It's something that we're asking now. Um, it's something that we're looking for data to prove. And I could go to the recent COVID pandemic and I could say that the president of New Zealand rules very differently, as a female, rules differently from Boris Johnson. Is that because she's a woman and he's a man, 
it gets tricky, right? Um, mm -hmm. There are data, there are discussions of this, and you guys can Google, do women rule differently from men? This is a hot topic, and there are people out there <laughs> pulling data to try to figure this out. And it's, it's really very interesting. But the thing that I think unites the entire world of complex societies, not hunter-gatherer societies, of which there are a few left, but we are all united in patriarchy. Patriarchy is not anything but rule by the fathers. It is a lineage descent through masculine lines. You could yeah. follow the lineage through a matriarchal line, but it's still the men who are ruling. And I don't know of any complex society that is a matriarchy. Mm -hmm. If anyone wants to come at me and say they know of one, please do. But I know of, of not. I can, t I can tell you don't feel strongly that... about this subject. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, it's so true. But what what's interesting is that it makes us look at the women who are ruling within a patriarchy in a different way. And the reason I think that is, is because if there is a patriarchy in place, a rule by the fathers, and women come to power in some way, they've had to do so by ruling behind the throne, whispering something into the powerful person's ear, taking the power from a man, or there being a crisis of some kind that demands the woman come in. Something has got to go wrong for a woman to be asked or included into power in a patriarchal world. And we are so used to seeing women associated with crisis in, in history that we assume that the women are responsible for the crisis rather than women being asked to come into power because there is a crisis. So there is this knee jerk hostility towards females in power that is still operating very much today. And any woman, and you included, know that you are treated differently from the male director of a museum or the male professor or that my student evaluations are very different from my male colleagues, that I'm much more likely to be called shrill and difficult and overbearing, um, emotional, whatever, angry, that's a good one, versus my male colleagues who might be, those, those same things might be accepted but treated in a more positive way. So the, these things the ancient Egyptians had to deal with, we have to deal with. And um, I, I just, I, firm, I got some pushback um, with my first book, The Woman Who Would Be King. And I was called um, universalist for including discussions of the modern world with the ancient world, as if they're both in hermetically sealed chambers and you should only have one discussion and the other and they have to be contextually dealt with and you can't have any crossover. And instead, I think that discussions of female power are hot now. And the ancient Egyptians can, can teach us quite a bit about how women were able to make it. And well, how I'm, I'm, wait, I'm waiting for your next book, which really goes to contemporary life, because I think you know a lot about it. I think you follow it. And it would be fascinating to, to, um, to, to read a book. So I put that on your list, if you would. Um, let me take you back to the iconography of the tomb wall paintings that have come down to us. These amazing things with crocodile heads and falcon heads and, and scepters and jewelry and furniture. They're so gorgeous and so full of rich design and color. Can you just tell us about the iconography and hieroglyphics in these tombs and how they speak to the gods and to power and to the afterlife? Because they are so spectacular. Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about the royal tombs in the Valley of the Kings, which it seems like you're you're pointing towards specifically with all of these different animal um, yes. god, animal-headed gods and things like that, the kinds of things that you wouldn't necessarily see in a private tomb, um, the more secret images and secret names and things that you had to be an initiated priest to have knowledge of. When you go into a tomb in the Valley of the Kings and you look at the scenes of the Book of Earth, or the book of the heavenly cow, or um, the book of night and day. It's overwhelming. You you feel confused. You feel like the ancient Egyptians knew these secrets that you can't even <laughs> imagine. There are weird things like, you know, all of a sudden a bunch of upside down people with all their heads cut off and pits of fire and little cauldrons of fire. Or there's the litany of Ray, which shows the 75 manifestations of the sun god. And some of them have heads of fire. Some of them have a beetle head. Um, some of them are just a cat and it's called Miu, the cat, I, you know, and, um, and you're like, well, I don't get it. What's going on here? And all of these, these images and texts, in my opinion, are meant to confound and confuse and make people think that 
that there was great power in these kingships, that they knew something and touched something that, that we couldn't, that they are divine. In my opinion, those tombs work upon our minds in the same way that the great pyramids of Giza work upon our minds. They make us believe that the people who created them, whether it's a tomb or a pyramid, are beyond human, are, have, are touching the heavens, know something that we cannot know, and we feel less than in their presence. And that propaganda is still working upon us today. So when Wonderful. I teach this stuff, when I teach this stuff to my grad students, you know, we'll go through these tombs and I'll, I'll assign somebody. I'm like, you got Book of the Dead, you get Book of Caverns, you get the Tomb of Ramses the Sixth, and then they do their presentations. And I say, okay, let's not get caught in the weeds. We can argue forever about what this stuff actually means. But as a social historian, I'm most interested in how they are used as tools of power. That's that's where I, I think I. I think we all want to be in that classroom <laughs> with you. That sounds <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, it, you know, in another of, of your in, in another of your books, uh, the woman who would be king, you tell of a sexy culture illustrated in sculptures that embarrassed the Victorian curators in England. And I'm just wondering if there's anything you can say about these sculptures that wouldn't totally embarrass us. Um, and, and how do archeologists actually know about the purpose of such sculptures? Oh, I could, I could talk about this for forever. And it's one way of waking <laughs> students. You wake the students up, you know, the students, they, they're in midterms, they've had their exams, they're falling asleep. And I'm like, so here we're gonna talk about the Big Bang and the creation of the ancient Egyptian cosmos. And the reason the, that we know what the ancient Egyptians thought about this stuff is because they put it in their pyramid text, their coffin text, their book of the dead, very straightforward statements like, and now everyone take a deep breath, we're gonna get sexual. Um, they'll say, and Atum put his phallus in his grasp that he might make orgasm with it and enliven himself. And it is very clear that the ancient Egyptian origins of the world were of a masculine entity who's floating around in like pre-created infinite black primeval space and nothing's been created yet. And he starts to think I could create myself and he reaches out a part of himself to another part of himself. The female part of himself is his hand, the jaret ends with a T, just like Smurf Smurfette, right? So the jaret mm -hmm. is female part of himself. He reaches that out to his phallus and all these masculine part of himself. He has sex with himself and this uh, orgasmic moment creates his consciousness. And the first thing that the god Atum does is he sneezes out a void of light. So it's so great. He sneezes out a void of light. And in that space, he then spits out moisture. And then those two divinities, the light and the moisture, have sex with one another in a normal human way. And then they create the, the generations of gods to follow. But the ancient Egyptians believed that every dead person needed to recreate themselves in the manner of that first time. And that even the sun god, every time he would set in the West, the sun god needed to recreate himself and impregnate his own mother with his future self, if that makes sense. Um, and all of this is, is uh, very sexually reified. And it's so sexually reified that if you go to an Egyptian temple today, and I hope there are some people that are watching this who have indeed been to Egypt, you will see temples all over the place with with erect penises and the God reaching out to grab it. And it, we laugh when we look at it, but for the ancient Egyptians, that moment of masturbatory ejaculation is the reason the Nile floods every year. It's the reason that life continues to reborn. It is the alpha and omega of everything. It's so important that if you and I were ancient Egyptian rich ladies and we were gonna commission a coffin, we would commission a coffin and name ourselves Osiris not Newt, not Isis. We would associate ourselves with Osiris so that we too could rebirth ourselves in that masculine way. So we would have to androgenize in a sense religiously so that we could be reborn into the next well, life. And, and I've written a whole article, set of articles about this and you can look them up. <laughs> but but it, it does <laughs> parallel what, what happens in human life. So I guess it, in a way it kind of makes sense. Um, so thank you, that's a, that's a wonderful description. Um, you know, I also know that... And, and Peggy, you'd also like the idea that the idea of the Virgin Mary could very much be an Egyptian idea. This idea that yes. the God creates himself, yes. 
right? That's Egyptian and it yeah. perfectly fits in this idea of Mary holding Jesus on her lap. It's Isis and Horus. I could go on, but that, well, that it works well. That whole connection with religion and Christianity and Judaism, that's a whole other conversation I hope we have in the future. Yeah. It's fascinating. But, but I know that some of your current research is on the reuse of coffins. Um, mm -hmm. And most likely because they are made of wood, they are um, a precious commodity in, in a desert environment. So I wanted to ask you, are these, um, is the reuse of coffins for economic reasons or to wipe out someone's memory? Can you tell us about your research in this area? And I'm assuming you're, you're working in Saqqara, which is one of the great burial centers of all time where they found the, the mega tomb and all the animal cults uh, abounded. So talk to us about your, your new research. Yeah. Um, I'm actually not working as much in Saqqara, though many of the coffins I work with do come originally from Saqqara. I'm mainly working in ancient Thebes, modern day Luxor. And that's because the preservation of wooden material is uh, surprisingly better than Saqqara. It seems like it can't possibly be true, given the things that are coming out of the ground from Saqqara. But it's mainly an economic um, uh, set of agendas, the coffin reuse is. Because, and, and this, this research, when I first started this some 15 years ago, it really touched a lot of people in that some people felt I was saying that the ancient Egyptians were immoral, that they would do something like this, that they would disturb their ancestors, take an ancestor out of a coffin, update it, replaster it, repaint it, and use it for a newly dead person. And really, when you look at it, if if you believe that the coffin is a means of transforming the dead and making sure they go into the parts of the afterlife that are that are where you want to go, and you have to meld the person with the sun god and Osiris by using that coffin, and there is your dead family member in front of you and you have no access to wood, the only moral solution for your newly dead family member is to remove an ancestor who's already been transformed, who's ostensibly already in the afterlife and those favorite parts, remove them, do some sort of a magical spell to make sure they're not angry and upset and take that coffin back into circulation and use it for your, for your family members. Now, if you wanted to destroy somebody's memory, you wouldn't have used that coffin. Almost certainly you would have destroyed that coffin. And there are many sarcophagi um, and coffins that were, that were purposefully destroyed in antiquity. So mostly of the 18th dynasty, um, but some other time periods as well. And so if you, if you really wanna get rid of someone's memory or somebody's title of, as king, then you can destroy objects um, so that you wouldn't even reuse them. Yeah. Well, well, let's go from those coffins to the coffin. Um, I think we'd be a bit remiss if we, having spoken so much about ancient women rulers, uh, to not address what's been called for all time, the most extraordinary of discoveries. And that wasn't the tomb of a woman, um, that was the boy King Tutankhamun. And the story starts you know, with archeologist Howard Carter, whose sponsor was Lord Carnarvon. Um, it'd be interesting to mention for our audience um, who are devotees of Downton Abbey, that uh, Lord Carnarvon's ancestral estate Highclere was the site for the filming of Downton Abbey. So if you, you visually have been there. Um, but uh, Carter discovered Tut's tomb in 1922, and Carnarvon was present when the tomb was opened, and this spectacular array of objects were found that continue to dazzle us today. But if this is the most celebrated of all finds, what is the significance of Howard Carter's discovery? Did we learn anything new from, from this uh, wonderful discovery? We continue to learn from, from this discovery. Uh, it's from such an unusual time period in ancient Egyptian history. Tutankhamun was, we think, the son of Akhenaten, an 18th dynasty king who was arguably the world's first monotheist, though that would start a bar fight amongst many <laughs> Egyptologists, I know. And because of that, you have this extraordinary preservation of materials that show one religion, and then show the Orthodox religion being returned. So the tomb is a, a microcosmic view into a society that's in great transition and coming out of great turmoil. And you can use these objects to see that, well, reuse is something that's extraordinarily interesting in the tomb of Tutankhamun. 
For instance, um, Nicholas Reeves, an Egyptologist in Britain, has done a great deal of work on this subject and has shown how the famous throne of Tutankhamun, it shows him with his sister wife, Anka Senpa Aten, was actually made for his father, Akhenaten, and had Nefertiti on it, and there was all kinds of changes to that throne to update it for Tutankhamun, which is surprising and extraordinary in and of itself. But not only that, all of those coffins in that tomb were arguably made for a different king. And the cartouches show that the, the names were reused. And they weren't trying, as we just talked about, to destroy the memory of that older king. And instead, they were claiming all of those objects for Tutankhamun. And a close look at the mask of Tutankhamun, which I think most of you can just see in your mind's eye without any pictures necessary. If you look at the mask, and I've gotten to look at it up close without the, the uh, glass, the plexiglass in front of it, the cartouche on the shoulder shows clear traces of another name having been there and of a longer cartouche. And Nicholas Reeves argues that that mask and arguably the entire coffin set of Tutankhamun belonged to a king named Ankhepru Re. And this Ankhepru Re could be, and most Egyptologists agree on this now, no, no one else but Nefertiti as co-king with her husband Akhenaten. So Nefertiti mm, had a whole that's, thing. That's interesting. Isn't that crazy? So that, that, that thing of that Tutankhamun coffin set, and this has all just been discovered in the last five to 10 years. So there is mm -hmm. more being worked out, right? But that entire coffin set was not originally made for Tutankhamun, but was made for this Ankhepru Re, who may have been Nefertiti. You can't get more convoluted and wonderful, and it's it's very soap opera ish. I love it. We, you know, what I found what I found in my library, I found the original uh, catalog from the exhibition Tutankhamun that was done in America fifty years ago, and it's got your name on it if you want it, and you don't have it because it's rather rare. But, that's awesome! Um, wow, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, that's yours. Um, I, I also, I've been interested in a phenomenon that's both historical and amusing um, called Egyptomania, which, you know, means enthusiasm for everything related to ancient Egypt. And I suppose, as you mentioned earlier, Egyptomania really goes back to the Greeks and R Romans when, when there was an awareness, um, especially when Emperor Augustus conquered Egypt in 31 BC, they would have brought all kinds of things home. But more recently, this phenomena occurred in the 19th century with Napoleon's Egyptian campaigns, which we've mentioned, and when he took scholars and scientists along. That was the first ancient, of time that ancient remains were really that documented. And as a result, there was tremendous interest and curiosity. So the idea of Egyptomania continued into the early 20th century, and we've just talked about Tut's tomb, and um, it continued immediately after that, <laughs> the movie The Mummy, um, and it lives on today. And I'd like to give our audience just an idea of some of the intriguing and wacky things that appeared um, before I asked my question of you. We had Verdi's Aida, which premiered in 1871. Furniture and interior decoration appeared, most of it considered kitsch. Uh, after Tet's discovery in the early 20th century, we have Art Deco fashion and textiles and more modern interiors that surfaced. There was Egyptian rival architecture. Recent examples today can be found in Las Vegas and Dubai, and while they're well done, they too could be considered somewhat quiche. Egyptian themes were used in advertising. There were Egyptian theme parties. There were um, mummy unwrapping parties. I have no idea what else they did. And Edgar Allan Poe wrote Words with a Mummy. Louisa May Alcott wrote The Mummy's Curse. And our very own Washington Monument is an Egyptian obelisk. As you've pointed out, a lot of them came out of Egypt. There's a hilarious Steve Martin skit as King Tutankhamun. And there's a recent production of Akhenaten by the New York Metropolitan Opera that's so beautiful about Amenhotep IV or, and his wife Nefertiti, so Akhenaten. And it combines the style of ancient Egypt with, with modern imagery and performance. It's just spectacular. And we really haven't even gotten to Hollywood. So Dr. Cooney, do you share the subject, this subject with your students and are you amused or horrified by it? Not horrified. And I don't study it systematically. Many of my colleagues do. Many of my colleagues have Egyptomania collections of their own that they collect <laughs> in their own homes. You know, we don't collect antiquities, um, but we can collect antiques. And so many of my, my colleagues do have uh, Egyptomania collections and, and look into um, the Egyptian theater in, in uh, Hollywood or, you know, and, and have examined all of these things. 
Um, I haven't, but I am interested in the subject as, as it is understood broadly, mm -hmm. why we are obsessed with ancient Egypt mm -hmm. and why people around the world are obsessed with ancient Egypt. It's one of the few places where you draw attention from China, from Japan, from Buenos Aires, from, from Texas, from you know Germany, wherever. People are very interested in ancient Egypt. They're intrigued by it. They, they're puzzled by it. They want to know more. It, it, it creates hunger in children. They're like, what's, what's going on? We, we need to know more about these mummies. And I think that the, as I, and I was, I was co-curator of the Tutankhamun exhibition when it came to LACMA in 2005, which was the opening of the new Tutankhamun wave to sweep the world. And I saw people, you know, beating down the doors to get into that exhibition. And I know my own interests can't be explained to my own mother, let alone to myself. What, so what is it? You know, why, why are we all so obsessed with Egypt? And I think we've touched upon a lot of it in this conversation. We've talked about the gold and the treasures and all of those things. I think that it goes deeper than that. It's this idea of an everlasting materiality where the thing lasts for so long that, that we can see that these humans existed in time and space even thousands of years ago. For, for, I've dug in tombs and found um, pieces of dried fruit that look like unsulfured um, apricots from Trader Joe's. That's amazing, right? <laughs> right. To be able to, to find a piece of dried fruit that's, that's 3,000 years amazing. old, that's extraordinary. Yeah. Um, and this idea that even their bodies don't decay, that we that these people just continue to live on forever, that continuity is something to which we are very attracted. And we want to know more. We want to know how they did it. We want that continuity for ourselves, personally, for our state, our country. And then finally, I would say that the other reason that we are so attracted to the ancient Egyptians, why Herodotus was, why the Romans were, is that they perfected this idea of divine kingship better than anybody else on the planet. A, a king that, and that's what my next book is about, and I'm not trying to like sneak in the plug, but this is what's on the brain and what's obsessing me. And it's called the good kings, and I call it that for a reason, because the Egyptians excelled at presenting an authoritarian, almost totalitarian power as if it were moral. And that's something that makes us feel safe, taken care of by daddy, um, something that, that we want in our world as well, many of us do increasingly, and many of us are turning towards authoritarianism around the world and in the United States. And so... It's an interesting thing to see how our obsession with ancient Egypt brings up all of our own stuff, and Egyptomania is no different. And and that uh, that now that obsession started, I mean, right after um, Tut's tomb. I mean, because it was only ten years later that the Mummy movie came out with Boris Karloff. That was 1932. Only ten years later, um, actresses in in Hollywood have loved to portray the Egyptian queens. You've got Theta Berra, Claudette Colbert, Cleopatra, uh, of course, played by Elizabeth Taylor. And I, I, I really, I, I kind of get why it's so interesting. And I think you really laid out there why there's this phenomena really continues today. And I want to go back to, um, to one serious note about your research, even in death preparations and life beliefs and gender studies, you've, it's taken you all over the world to fabulous museum collections. And I thought our audience might wanna know which ones you think are found to be the most illuminating for what you're doing. Uh, if you would address that, where would you send them? And also, what would you say to students who really wanna study this field? Okay, so I'll start with the, the first part. Um, there is ancient Egypt almost everywhere because there's so much stuff preserved in this dry climate when they're put in tombs. Um, you, and because of colonialism, you, we have been, and the art market, which is still ongoing, unfortunately, we've been able to fill museums with Egyptian things. So you can, you can look and see where there's a collection near you. There's probably Egyptian objects there that you can go and visit. As for which collections are the best, I mean, that's, um, it's not that hard to answer because I can, I can tell you that the, the best collections right now are in Egypt where they are on a building spree of extraordinary proportions, putting together state of the art museums. One just recently opened the National Museum of Egyptian Civilization 
that is housing the coffins and bodies of the 18th, 19th, and 20th dynasty Egyptian royalty and a number of other objects. And there's the Grand Egyptian Museum, which should be opening in the next couple of years. And of course, there's the Egyptian Museum Cairo at Tahrir Square, um, in front of which the Egyptian Revolution of 2011 happened in, on all of our television screens. So those are the best collections by far, bar none. Um, and then just traveling throughout Egypt and seeing all of these different temples and tombs is um, is the best is the best place to go. Um, but Peggy, for your oh, I'm so glad that oh, you ahead, that you ahead. mentioned. Yeah. Well, I, I'm just so glad you mentioned the new National Museum of Egyptian Civilization because I wanted to tell our audience about um, this crazy motorcade of mummies um, or the golden parade of mummies that happened recently with, with a huge celebration when these large motored vehicles with perfect suspension and humidity control carried 22 mummies, 18 kings and four queens to the new museum. Um, I remember when I was reading about this, uh, one of the journalists said that it was uh, equal parts Aida, RuPaul, and Lenny Reifenstahl. And I thought that was kind of an apt description. But I mean, in this big celebration of this, there was even a performance in front of Hatshepsut's temple using architecture's propaganda the way she would have done. So um, it, it's just a, an interesting phenomenon, and, and, and everyone can look it up online if you're interested. But it does say something about you know, modern Egypt and how they are celebrating their, their ancient history. But before we go, I have one last rather important question for you, Dr. Cooney. Since we are so obsessed with food and wine here in St. Helena and in the Napa Valley, what do we know about from the tombs about food, beer, wine, or mead of the ancient Egyptians? Did they like to eat? The ancient Egyptians did like to eat. And I love this topic of food because even food is political or especially food is political. <laughs> and, um, I, you know, today, so let me talk about modern Egyptian cuisine. It's interesting that modern Egyptian cuisine, though I love it, is it, it has the reputation of being like the Irish food of Europe, <laughs> which it means it's not good, right? <laughs> it means that it's kind of samey. It's not as spicy. It's a little more bland. It's a little more expected. Um, and that if you think of the best food of the Middle East, you know, where do you go? Then Lebanon is the place where people talk about Morocco. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting thing that when you talk about the best food in the world, generally they come that comes from places where there is more social competition people are trying to one up each other whose hummus is best whose pasta is best whose um sauce is better and so you'll see places like italy which is still not um unified in my opinion having some of the best food mm -hmm. or um or parts of the levant which is obviously still having all kinds of political competition internally it has some of the best food egypt geographically it encourages a more um, inward looking place that's harder to invade, that is more separate from other places, this, this cluster of people on the Nile Valley with deserts on either side. And that protection from others and that unification internally creates a food system that is um, not homogenous because there are regional differences between Delta and Nile Valley, but it's... Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's less spicy and less um, less differentiated internally than maybe other places. And one could argue you would see the same in the ancient world. So what we have for the ancient world, I don't think there's any recipes preserved from Pharaonic Egypt, um, though I'd have to check on that. And there are people who have written books about ancient Egyptian food, but you would have had... Yeah, I remember, I remember the... Yeah, go ahead. The, the um, do you remember the uh, legend, the the uh, the tomb of the legendary King Midas that they think they have found, and they found um, lamb and lentils and other kinds of things there. Yeah, in, in modern day I, Turkey I believe. and Anatolia, I've actually been inside yeah. that burial yeah. chamber, and it's uh, the Midas Mound. It's an incredible thing, and it's surrounded with um, massive cedar logs all around, and you just smell that that cedar mm -hmm. as you walk into that tomb. Um, yeah, funerary repasts have been found, including Tutankhamun. You have you have meat, haunches of meat, beef, things like that. You have bread. You don't have as much prepared food. It's more like here's some onions, here's some bread, here's some um, other, you know. A, a some apricots. Of, yeah, so not as many recipes <laughs> apricots. Are, are preserved. But the ancient Egyptians would have, the rich Egyptian, would have had the proteins of lamb, beef, 
um, no chicken yet. Um, that at least that wasn't a common thing, but duck and goose. Um, and then all of the typical vegetables, you know, the lentils and the chickpeas and onions, um, particularly a long green onion type thing. Um, Mulukhea is a very well-known Egyptian plant that is, is um, almost gelatinous and okra-like when it's cooked. And it's very popular in Egypt today. And I'm sure it, was, it existed in ancient Egypt that you would make a stew out of these Mulukhea leaves and then serve it with a protein of some kind. Um, today, they often serve it with rabbit. Um, so, you know, and, but the other thing to keep in mind is that the ancient Egyptians, while they would have hunted wild game, they, they often would have had wild plants um, that they foraged. When they were growing their own things, the main, the main consumption would have been bread and beer. And so you have a whole population that's a little bit drunk most of the time, much of the time, and um, very happy with cheap carbs. So it's it's a way of creating a yeah, large population and a population that's internally pretty um, happy and, and not too likely to, to engage in regular rebellions or revolts or competition. So food is important and food creates politics too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We had, we had to ask that question. When I think back over what you commented on today, I think you would have been an amazing woman ruler or politician in ancient Egypt, the world today, or even the afterlife. This is great. Um, I'm afraid we're at the end of our time and the forum's president, Doug Barr, is gonna pop back in momentarily. But first, let me say thank you for sharing your immense knowledge with us today. You're such a talent and you're passionate about your subject and personable in your approach and willing to talk to all of us today so that we could indulge our interest in your subject and our fantasies about your profession, so thank you. The St. Helena Forum for Innovation and Creativity found the creativity in the beauty and designs and paintings and the relief sculptures of the ancient Egyptians, but we found the innovation and in how you approach your subject, working from science and knowledge to imagine more about the life of these women rulers of ancient Egypt. On the creative side, um, I'd like to end with a wonderful quote from one of my favorite journalists who writes on arts and culture. His name is Jason Farrago. He commented on ancient rulers and their creations saying, and I quote, you can have sway in the short term through your army and your treasury, but if you want to last forever, make something beautiful. Doug, we return to you. Thank you, Peggy. And thank you, Kara, for letting us listen in on this incredible conversation. Well, this wraps up the last of our limited series of virtual programs, and I am proud to say that with these presentations, we've reached an audience in nearly 40 states and 40 countries, including well over a thousand students, academics, older citizens, all of you part of our core audience of folks who are simply curious about the world we inhabit. If you missed a forum presentation or you want to share one with friends, they're available on our website, shforum.org. And to find out how you can pre-order a signed copy of Kara Cooney's new book, The Good Kings, Absolute Power in Ancient Egypt and the Modern World, go to her website, karacooney.squarespace.com. The forum board has decided to take a summer hiatus to begin thinking about new programming and when it might be safe to return to in-person events. We'll keep you posted on our website. And finally, thank you all for joining us at the St. Helena Forum and a special thanks to all of these people whose generosity has made this and future presentations possible.